Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. We are glad that you've chosen to join us for worship this morning, whether here in person or on the video on the YouTube. We're really excited that you're with us today. Just a couple of very quick announcements. Once again, for those wishing to sing, there are 15 of these masks that allow you to do that. They're in the foyer. Just be glad to have you pick one up and sing with us. And uh, you've probably all heard the announcement already that Governor Inslee is moving the state into phase three here in another week or two. We don't yet know exactly what that's going to look like for churches, but that will be posted on his website sometime this week, and we'll just continue to move forward as the state continues to open up and praise God all the way, right? All right, yeah, I'm excited, whatever it means. Anything is better than nothing, right? So we'll just keep going forward. Also, and Larry will tell you more about this here in just a second, but just a reminder, we are collecting an offering for the Annie Armstrong North American Mission Board offering that is done every year at Easter time. And all I want to say about it is when you know what the Lord would have you do, please use one of these so that those who count the money can identify that that's what it's for, because we want to make sure the missionaries do receive anything that you give. So I'll let Larry come and tell you more about that. I just want to say that we'll now watch a video that uh, tells about the Annie Armstrong offering as well as tell you a little bit about Annie Armstrong herself. For almost a hundred years, in big cities with a hundred skyscrapers, in tiny towns with one stoplight, on college campuses and Native American reservations, and churches too many to count, hundreds of thousands of men and women and boys and girls have made hundreds of thousands of life-changing decisions. Almost none of them knew her name, and yet she was there. Annie Armstrong lived more than a hundred years ago. Only this one picture of her survives. History could have easily forgotten her, but Annie Armstrong is worth remembering. In the late 1800s, when most women had no voice, Annie was one of the first to speak up. First for the urban poor in her hometown of Baltimore, and then for Southern Baptist missionaries around the world who desperately needed support. It was for these people that she helped start the National Woman's Missionary Union. As its first executive leader, she gave women a platform in their local church and in ways that they'd never done before. These women helped focus Southern Baptist attention on the hurting and the lost and the missionaries trying to reach them. Annie wrote letters, 18,000 in just one year. And she traveled across America, encouraging missionaries and inspiring churches to pray, to give, and to act. She worked long hours, paid her own expenses, and refused to accept a salary. And in the darkest days of the Depression, right before she died, an offering was named after her. Today, the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering helps missionaries in the U.S. and Canada start new churches and meet needs through Compassion Ministries. Over the years, Southern Baptists have given more than $1 billion to that offering, and 100% of it, every penny, has gone straight to the mission field. There's still work left to do. A need is bigger than ever, and that's why even though she lived more than a century ago, and even though only one picture of her survives, Annie Armstrong's influence lives on. Because today in North America, just as it's been from the beginning, anywhere a missionary is sent, every time a new church is born, anytime someone gives to her offering so that a lost person might be found, Annie is there.
so thankful to be in your house this morning. We appreciate your care for us, and we ask that you be with us this morning. Help us to focus upon the message and to apply it to our lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 5. If you would find that in your copy of the scriptures, John chapter 5. When you do, if you're able and would like, you, we would invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 19. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. The Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be astonished. Indeed, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whomever he wishes. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be astonished at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. May the Lord give blessing and understanding to his word today. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for the privilege of coming together, even with restrictions. We thank you that we still have the privilege and the freedom to gather together for worship. We have sung wonderfully today great songs of the faith, true songs, songs that remind us of your saving work and the resurrection that is available to life as opposed to the resurrection that is available to those who reject life and are resurrected to eternal death, as it were. Lord, thank you for calling our name. Thank you for calling us out and thank you for giving us the faith we needed to respond to that call. We pray for the millions upon millions who have yet to respond positively to your invitation to the resurrection to eternal life. And we pray that they would have their hearts and minds open to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And especially we pray for people hearing the gospel, whether through this ministry or some other ministry today, that today even would be the day that some would give their life to you through Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word and the truth that it proclaims. We thank you for helping us to understand it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask already in advance your help in applying what we discover in your word today. We love you, we worship you, we honor you, we adore you. This is all about you, Lord. We pray to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. We pray in his name, amen.
Thank you, Sally. Appreciate that. Well, in our last time together in this series, we came to the moment of God actually destroying the current heavens and earth. Everybody left really encouraged, right? That follows the millennial reign of Christ on the earth. And you might remember from Revelation chapter 20 that nothing tangible remains, whether on earth or in space. There's just this emptiness, this void in space, except for this great white throne. And Jesus is sitting upon it ready to enact the final judgment before ushering in the new heaven, the new earth, and eternity future. And in our next and final time together in this series, we'll take a look at those, the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. But before going there, I thought it might be helpful to take a look at the various judgments that are mentioned in Scripture to see if we can somehow get a handle on what they are, when they take place, and so forth. And so to begin with, I'd ask you to join me by looking at Matthew chapter 16. And as you do, just let me set the stage by reminding us that when Jesus came to this earth the first time, he came as the suffering servant. He came as the gentle shepherd. He came calling people to himself for redemption and salvation so that relationship with God could again be possible. He came to serve. He himself said that. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He came to declare the truth. He told that to Pilate. I've come to declare the truth. So his two reasons for coming were to seek and to save the lost and to declare the truth. When he comes again, he will come as the reigning king, the sovereign of all creation and the judge of every person. I don't say that to scare anybody, but to simply point out that according to John chapter 5 that we read earlier, God the Father has committed all judgments to God the Son. Obviously, the Father could do it. He could do it very easily. But for whatever reason, the Father has chosen not to do that. In his sovereign will, he has delegated all judgments to the Son. Jesus made that comment in John chapter 5. I want us to begin in Matthew because some people are always a little bit nervous When you announce you're going to be preaching a series of messages and prophetic things, they think, oh boy, here we go. Another church that's going to become another group of wild-eyed fanatics seeing 666 and everything and identifying every other member of Congress as the Antichrist and on and on and on it goes. I hope it's become quite clear that in this series that hasn't been my desire at all. My goal has been, as always, to be clear, to be biblical, to be relevant, to be practical, and to remain balanced, okay? The fact is, a number of biblical prophecies have already been fulfilled, and that doesn't make us fanatics. It just causes us to say, hey, praise God, look at what he's doing, and because he's done all that, we know he's going to do what's left, Here's a case in point. Jesus makes this wonderful prophecy. When he says it, it's a prophecy. It's a fact now. But it was a prophecy when he said, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, I'm telling you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I want you to notice five words. I will build my church. Now, obviously, he doesn't mean I'm going to construct buildings with pews and carpets, mortars and bricks. He wasn't promising budgets and programs. He wasn't even referring to denominations and and organizations. When he said, I will build my church, what he meant is I'm going to call out people from all of the nations to myself. That's what the word church actually means. Ecclesia, called out ones. I'm going to call out from all the nations people to myself. Why that's important is all the way through the Old Testament, basically, and right on into the time of the Gospels, God's plan and God's activity primarily was accomplished through the Jews. Not exclusively, but primarily. Remember, he chose them to be his people, and they remain his chosen people to this day. He chose them to be blessed by him and to function as missionaries in the world through whom he would call people to himself. So it was very much a Jewish-focused thing. But suddenly, notice, in this prediction, Jesus declares that this mission-minded God, whose desire is that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 
He's no longer going to work exclusively through the Jewish people. He's going to work through all of those that he calls out to himself. The whole ecclesia. I'm going to build a church. And according to Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost that immediately followed Jesus' death, burial, ascension, resurrection, all that, that began to happen. God descended upon those relatively few disciples in that upper room in Jerusalem. Remember, he poured out his spirit on them, and suddenly everybody in Jerusalem was hearing the good news in their own language. And many responded and were baptized, and the church, being drawn from all people, began to happen. And it's still going on all around the world, right up to this nanosecond. Jesus is still in the process of fulfilling that prophecy of building his church. Whenever anybody of any people group, of any language group, of any socioeconomic group gives their life to God through faith in Christ, they become a member of the ecclesia. Isn't that exciting? That doesn't make you wild-eyed and fanatic, does it? That's just exciting to see that. Now, as we've already seen in this series, the day will come when both the church and the Holy Spirit will leave this earth. So please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 for a quick, just kind of a quick review of all this. That a day is coming when this official building program called the church will stop. And the Lord will begin another program, which we'll get into in a minute. And he'll turn back to the Jews, his chosen people. And he'll do some amazing things, some necessary things through his chosen people, the Jews. And to initiate that, the church is taken off the scene. See verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul says, We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who've died, so that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. Meaning when you have buried somebody and you stand beside their grave, it's perfectly understandable that the tears flow. It's perfectly reasonable that grief is expressed. It's never wrong to grieve a person's absence from your life. That's that's normal. It's not even wrong to go back and visit their grave if that means something to you. Just be certain that you understand that you're not any closer to them standing there than you are anywhere else, and you can't actually talk to them. But if it has special meaning for you, well, that's fine. The point is, whatever you do in your grief, however you express your grief, don't do it as if it's hopeless as a Christian. If you and the person who's died are both Christians... You will see them again one day. Keep reading. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will what? Bring with him those who have died. That's your mama, your daddy, your grandpa, your grandpa, whoever. They're coming with him. You will see them again. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord, that rapture moment, we who are still walking this earth, we will by no means precede those who have died because the Lord himself with a cry of command and then the archangels call with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, we who are still walking this earth, we who are left here, we will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. How about that? Ready for that? Let's have a Baptist business meeting. Who wants that to happen today? As if we had any control over it, right? But that's our hope. Those verses refer, I believe, to the rapture of the church, an event that I will believe that will happen prior to the beginning of the, of the tribulation era. I believe that because of what's stated in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We won't go there. We've looked at that already. So following the rapture of the church is this period of intense tribulation on the earth, a period of seven years in which God will deal with the whole world in one sense for its rejection of the Messiah, but he's also going to deal very directly with the Jewish people calling a bunch of them to himself one last time. At the end of that seven-year period, as the armies of the world are gathered together for war, Christ comes in what's known as his second coming, his second advent. He won't simply come in the clouds, as 1 Thessalonians talks about. He will come all the way to the earth to set up his 1,000-year reign on earth. We've already seen that, where there'll be a perfect environment on the earth. The worship of God will be worldwide. The economy will be perfect. The justice system will be perfect. All of those Old Testament prophecies that we looked at before, which have not yet taken place, will finally take place. 
And then you might remember at the end of that thousand year period, Satan is released. There are a number of those willing to follow him, but that rebellion is quickly put down. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. The present heavens and earth are destroyed, which leads to the creation of the new heaven and the new earth and eternity future. Now, interspersed here and there through all of this are several judgments. For a moment, it might help you to take a look at that chronological chart we keep giving you. You might even want to make notes on that chart of which judgment goes where, if it helps you to see it visually. I'm just going to really quickly walk you through them, and then we'll go back and take a look at each one with a little more detail. So very quickly, the first judgment we're going to talk about this morning is already past tense. It happened at the cross. Satan and all of the demons were finally judged as they were defeated at the cross. Also, death and sin were taken care of at the cross. That's past tense. We'll come back to that, but that's where that goes. You can even draw a little cross or something, and just that's the first judgment. The next two judgments we're going to talk about are, are present tense. They're going on still right now. Every day, somewhere in some life, they go on. One is known as the self judgment of the Christian. It's where you examine yourself in light of God's word to see if there's sin that you need to confess. The other is divine discipline. So they're going on constantly throughout the church age. The, the divine discipline is when a carnal Christian refuses to repent, refuses to confess, refuses to change. And so God is forced to step in and do something. All of the rest of the judgments are still future tense. There's the judgment seat of Christ. If you're marking on your little sheet there, it will take place right after the rapture, right before the tribulation begins or as it begins on earth. This judgment seat of Christ takes place in heaven. Then there are two similar but very separate and distinct judgments. One is concerning the Jews. The other is concerning the Gentiles. Now, this gets a little trickier because some see the tribulation as when the beginning point of the Jewish judgment happens. They, they relate it to what's known as the time of Jacob's trouble, and that could be. Others place this judgment of the Jews at the end of the tribulation. So flip a coin and decide where you want to put that on your chart. The judgment against the Gentiles, also known as the sheep goat judgment, definitely takes place when Christ returns at the end of the tribulation. And we'll get into this in more detail in just a minute, but that's just kind of giving you an idea of where this stuff goes. At the end of the millennium, apparently, and I say apparently because, again, the Bible is not very clear about when this one happens, but apparently at the end of the tribulation, there's the judgment against the fallen angels. Scripture really doesn't give us a whole lot about this. I'll show you what little is there, but that's apparently where it will happen. And then lastly, we know for a fact that the great white throne judgment takes place at the end of the millennial kingdom before the new heavens and earth are created. It takes place once the present heavens and earth are destroyed. There's just this vast nothingness except this great white throne. So there they are. One judgment, the cross, past tense, Two judgments going on still to this day. The others are all future tense. So with that outline in mind, let me get you some information on some of these. We'll, go, we'll have to go quickly. But here they are. In the past, the Lord has already judged Satan. He's judged and defeated. He was judged at the cross. Sin was taken care of at the cross. And death was taken care of at the cross. G Think about this. Jesus Christ, first of all, bore all of sin of all of humanity in one point of time. That's just phenomenal. But at the same time, the Bible says he took the sting out of death. Isn't that something? And not only that, but at the cross, Jesus crushed Satan's head. Remember God predicting that back in Genesis? So he took the sting out of death, he dethroned sin, and he crushed the head of Satan, meaning it's possible for you now to live beyond your sin nature, to live beyond the fear of death, and to live beyond the threat of Satan. How good is that? By personally receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have all those promises. You have the promise of life beyond the grave. We read of that in 1 Thessalonians. We have the promise that both our physical death and our spiritual death are taken care of. As, as God the Father wrote, paid in full across Jesus' cross. And as the writer of Hebrew tells us, 
Jesus is the complete, perfect sacrifice for our sins. There's no law. You know, you, who brought an animal with you today to have it sacrificed for your sins today? Anybody do that? If you did, you can take it home with you. Because you don't need it. Isn't that great? This wonderful news. Wonderful news. Okay. Since Jesus took care of all of our sins at the cross, do we really even need to worry about sin in our life right now? Isn't it all just automatically forgiven because of grace? Well, yes, we do need to be concerned about it because no, it is not automatically forgiven. When we come to God by faith in Jesus, because of Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, in the moment that you did that, all of your past sins were completely erased and covered over. That was automatic. The Bible says that when you come to God in faith through Christ, all of the old passes away and what? Everything becomes new. Everything becomes whatever has happened in your past. It's all for that one little second in time. You are a perfect person. Do you remember that being perfect? You, you actually had a perfect moment. Now, I don't know how long it lasted for you. I was, a, I was a boy, so it didn't last very long for me, but maybe it lasted a little longer for you. But in that moment, you were abs- if you had died then, it would have been, you, know, you were perfect. The substitutionary death of Jesus, completely satisfying all of God's demands against sin, the Father pouring out all of his wrath on the Son at the cross, when you came to Christ, you were completely washed clean. Peter says he bore our sins in his body on the tree. So that we, being dead in our sins, should live under righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Meaning spiritually healed. Just as Isaiah means by his stripes we are spiritually healed. But that doesn't mean that every sin we commit from then on is automatically forgiven. It is forgivable, but it's not automatically forgiven. 1 John 1, 9, remember this? It says, if we confess our sins... That first word's important, if. It's conditional. The forgiveness from God towards you and I, even as his child, that forgiveness is based upon confession. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Implied, if you refuse to confess, then don't expect forgiveness and cleansing. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. At the moment of our confession, at that moment, all of our past sins are automatically forgiven and we are made clean. That's the good news. The not so good news is we continue to live on with our sin nature, which means we continue to sin from time to time. Those sins need to be confessed so that they can be forgiven. They're not automatically forgiven by grace. Confession and repentance are necessary. And and here's another place that tells us this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, Paul says, Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to what? Repentance. For you felt a godly grief. That's interesting. A godly grief. So that you were not harmed in any way by us, because godly grief produces repentance that leads to literally deliverance and brings no regret. But worldly grief produces death. Our sins are forgivable because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But each and every one of those sins have to be confessed through godly grief leading you to repentance. Not just worldly grief that says, oh, I'm sorry. Meaning usually I'm sorry I got caught. Godly grief leads you to, oh, I am so sorry, God that I broke your will, that I violated your word, that I went against you, and I confess that. And when you go in that kind of confession to God, you go claiming the blood of Christ as that cleansing agent for your sin, and he washes you and makes you clean because of the judgment against your sin already taken care of at the cross. Which is why there is no longer any need for any animal sacrifice because God has already given himself as the single perfect sacrifice for all time. That's why Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. 
Now, in order to enter into confession when necessary, appropriate self-examination is needed. And that brings us to this judgment. It's going on today, the self-judgment of the Christian. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to read about this and divine discipline all here in one place. That's why I choose this passage because it mentions both. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We've just been talking about our own confession of our sins, and that relates very directly to this self-judgment that should go on continually in your life and mine. Now, as most of you know, the context of this is the Lord's table and how it was being abused by the Corinthian church. In verse 23, Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, notice a warning. He's been talking about the Lord's table and how you do it. But now he says, Now, just a minute. Before you enter into this very serious time of worship, know this. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Which is why it is our custom in this church and many Bible believing churches do it. Before taking the elements of the Lord's table, we encourage you to examine yourself. And we even take time in the service for you to do that. In fact, I was reminded just recently that because of the new way we've been doing that, dealing with the cup and all this pre-filled stuff, I've been kind of guilty of cutting that short. And so we need to make sure, I need to make sure, we give you more time for that examination. But anyway, what is the purpose of this? Well, connected to the Lord's table is to prevent us from taking part in the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. That's what Paul says, meaning don't participate, don't eat the bread, don't drink the juice with known unconfessed sin in your life. But in a broader sense, as we saw already, don't go on in any capacity as a child of God, ignoring sin in your life. When God makes us aware of something, we need to go before him and confess it, which simply means to admit that we've acted contrary to his will. And, and we need to repent of it, which means we need to change. We need to make a commitment with God that we don't want to do that again. This judgment is ongoing for as long as we live on earth. Once we're taken into the Lord's presence, this won't be necessary because when you stand in the Lord's presence, sin will no longer be part of your experience. But as long as we draw breath in this life, this should be an ongoing thing. Well, okay, but what if I choose not to do that? I mean, after all, it's not very much fun to examine myself and see if there's sin in there. I don't mind doing it for other people, but I don't want to do it for myself. Well, if you neglect self-judgment you run the risk of divine judgment. See verse 28. And again, the context is the Lord's table, but we're going to apply it a little broader than that, where Paul says, examine yourselves and then eat, and then only eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Very familiar words to those of you raised in the church. And again, specifically related to the table of the Lord. But let's face it. If we don't keep short account of sin every, each and every day, how high does the risk start to become that you might wander into a Lord's table service having sort of ignored something long enough that you forget about it and the next thing you know, you're participating in the table of the Lord in an unworthy manner, right? Right? The likelihood of you taking part in a communion service in an unworthy manner becomes very real if you don't continually deal with known sin in your life. And this says those who partake unworthily open themselves up to some form of divine discipline. In the case of the Corinthians, it was serious illness and even death. 
So hear that carefully. It's so easy to just kind of put it on ignore, put it on until suddenly we're, we're comfortable with something and we don't even feel like we need to confess it anymore. The Christian who doesn't take advantage of self-judgment, bringing their known sins to God through confession and repentance, just kind of going merrily on as if it's no big deal, that person truly does open themselves up to some kind of experience in divine discipline. But, Paul says, verse 31, if we will judge ourselves, we don't need to be judged in divine discipline. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. Why? So that we may not be condemned along with the world. You see, we're part of God's family. And God the Father is a perfect parent. And as in any healthy family, there has to be discipline among the children. God's preference is that we grow up and learn how to discipline ourselves. However, if we refuse to do that, like a good and faithful father, he'll take you to the woodshed. He really will. I've seen that happen in one life or another, in large ways and small, and I can tell you it's not fun. Please take God seriously. Nobody is allowed to get away with anything. The Bible says just because the sentence against an evil deed isn't executed quickly, we tend to think, ooh, got away with one. God sees, God knows, and God disciplines if we don't deal with it ourselves. Okay, ooh, in the time remaining, let's look at the judgments to come. All of these future tense. The next one is the judgment seat of Christ. If you just turn quickly back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We looked at this at length not too long ago. Just kind of remind you about it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul tells us that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? So that each may be recompensed for what he has done in the body. So not, it's not a judgment of salvation. It's a judgment of activity. Every Christian, you're already saved or you wouldn't be there. Every Christian will have their life evaluated by Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, we'll be tested as though by fire. Remember that? And what remains will be rewarded. What burns up, we will suffer loss. So what determines the outcome is not, are you saved or not? You are, or you wouldn't be there. The whole process of this is, what are you doing with it? The things that you do for God and for his kingdom, the things you do according to the will of the Lord in your life, those are the things that will remain and be rewarded. The things you do for self, the pursuits that are outside of God's will, not necessarily sinful, but just to get you off track. That's the stuff that will be burned up. Which to me is another reminder of how important self-judgment is, isn't it? I mean, a question we all need to be asking all the time is, is this thing that I'm doing, this objective that I'm pursuing, this decision that I'm making, this choice that I'm taking, is this what God wants of me? Or is it just what I want? Am I seeking to please him and serve him? Or am I just pleasing myself? It's an evaluation not only of action, but of motive. And how wise to be in a state of always evaluating that. Because it's going to be evaluated by Jesus when you and I stand before him. Okay? Okay. How about this judgment against the Jewish people? Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. There are several Old Testament passages that actually refer to this. Daniel chapter 9, Jeremiah chapter 30, Ezekiel chapter 20, Malachi chapter 3 has a whole lot of stuff about this. And from those sections, we know that the Lord is going to judge his chosen people, beginning with the priests and those who served in the temple, right on down through the nation. We also know, particularly from the Malachi passage, that he has what he calls a book of remembrance, which contains the names of those who feared him and kept covenant with him. Sort of like the book of life we're going to see in Revelation. In Matthew, the context is this tribulation and second coming of the Lord. His disciples, first of all, ask him, when will the temple be destroyed? When is all this stuff going to happen? And then they ask, what are the signs related to his... Sounds a lot like us, huh? God, when, 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 when? Jesus spends a lot of time answering the question about what. But concerning when, verse 36... 
He says, about that day and hour of his actual coming, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, nor even the Son, but only the Father. That's pretty clear, isn't it? It's, it's kind of Jesus' polite way of saying, stop asking me that stupid question, because I don't even know the answer to it. In verse 27, he puts it another way. As the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. You've seen lightning. Does it send any kind of announcement ahead of time? Here I'm coming. No, it's just whoosh across the sky it goes. And wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Perhaps a reference to those birds of prey we saw in Revelation chapter 19. See verse 30? The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. So there will be some signs of that. And then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, which to me makes it different from the rapture. Verse 37, as the days of Noah were, so will, the, the, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He says, for as the, um, in the days of Noah, they were doing all their normal stuff. And then verse 39, they knew nothing until the flood came. And then it swept them away. And so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. All the way through here is this reference to the coming, the literal coming of the Son of Man. Verse 40, two will be in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. For years, I'd been taught that that has to do with the rapture. But how can it? The context isn't about the rapture. This is the one who is, this is the context of one who is taken into the millennial kingdom and one who is sent away for future judgment. That's what they're taken and left. Now, there are other fine teachers of this who disagree with that, but since we're talking about a literal coming where all the nations see and go, oh no, that's not the rapture. That's the actual coming of Christ. In verses 45 to 51, Jesus talks about the need for faithfulness. And again, he's talking to these Jewish people about the Jewish people over whom he has given a great deal of responsibility. They are the chosen people. They are the ones through whom God wanted to bless the nations. And so those who are faithful are rewarded as opposed to those who are not. All of it spoken to this Jewish audience. Look at chapter 25. The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids take their lamps and go out to meet the bridegroom. You know this parable, the parable of the five wives, the five wise, the five foolish virgins, five of them having oil for their lamps, five of them who are not. Preparedness versus unpreparedness, faithfulness versus unfaithfulness. He says in verse 10, while those five foolish ones went to buy more oil, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. He said, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. These words are all directed to the Jews. I believe the Jews who are living at the end of the tribulation when Christ literally comes to the earth. The faithful Jews are invited in. Those who receive Christ as their Redeemer during the tribulation and who, who are faithful to Him, they come into the kingdom with Him. Those who are not are kept out. There's another parable in this chapter that has to do with talents. You know this one, verse 14. This is like a man who goes on a journey. He summons his slaves. You remember this? He gives certain talents to this one and certain talents to that one, and then he leaves. And then he comes back. And he determines their faithfulness. What determines their faithfulness? What they did with what they were given. And those who were proved faithful were faithful because they were part of God's kingdom plan. Those who proved faithless were faithless because they had rejected Jesus' lordship over them. And you'll notice when he does come back, verse 29, these servants who have handled things wisely and well, the Lord says to them, verse 29, for to those who have, more will be given. And they will have an abundance, but from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Interesting. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's very important because the phrase weeping and gnashing of teeth is never used in reference to the Gentile people. It is always used in reference to the Jewish people. Which is why I believe all this stuff that Jesus has just said is in reference to God's chosen people, the Jews. 
and, and many other commentators would tell you the same thing. He's warning them. You have been given a great deal as God's chosen people. It goes all the way back to Abraham, comes all the way to the present day, and to whom much is given, much is expected. And when I return, and I think that has to be at the end of the tribulation because of all those references in there, when I come back, I'm going to deal with my chosen Jewish people. And I'm going to find among them some who were faithful, who accepted Jesus as Messiah, and who lived their life accordingly. And I'm going to take them into myself and they're going to join me in my millennial kingdom. Remember, the disciples, the apostles are told they will sit on 12 thrones reigning over the nation of Israel. Remember that? As part of the millennial kingdom. So some of the Jews will come into the millennial kingdom. Those who reject Jesus as Messiah, who've accepted the mark of the beast, he'll turn them away. They'll be shut out of the banquet and they'll experience weeping and gnashing of teeth. In verse 31, without any announcement, Jesus shifts his attention from the Jews to the Gentiles, where he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. It's a key term. Nations is never used in reference to the Jews. It's always used in reference to the Gentiles. So he has shifted his subject matter. If you had your yarmulke on, you'd see it right away. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, he's talking about Jews. Nations? Oh, he's talking about Gentiles. So this is a judgment on the Gentile people only. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another like a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left, and then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he goes on to talk about how he was in need and they met his need. And, he, and they came and ministered to him. And, and they say in verse 40, uh, or in verse earlier, in the, they say somewhere, when did we do that? Verse 40, he says, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now remember, context, 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 brothers. He's not talking about Christians. His brothers would be the Jews. He's saying to these Gentile Christians who come out of the tribulation, the way you treated the Jews during this tribulation, the way you conducted yourself toward the Jews during this tribulation demonstrates. It doesn't make you mine, but it proves you are mine. And because you've proven that, you come into the kingdom. It's not that their good works save them any more than it does us. As with us, it's those good works demonstrate you really are saved. Then he turns to the goats and says a similar thing, only you didn't do that, and so you're obviously not part of the kingdom, and so away you go. He says, verse 45, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go in, away into eternal punishment, the righteous into eternal life. And the millennial kingdom begins. And then, very quickly... There's this strange judgment, the judgment of the fallen angels. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, and you're going to be relieved to hear me say, I'm not going to say hardly anything about it because there's hardly anything to say. 2 Peter chapter 2. As most of you know, the fallen angels are the demons. That includes Satan himself. All of them once were angels. Satan was once an angel, if you didn't know that. Uh, he, he was apparently one of the higher up angels. Some believe he was one of the archangels. Maybe he was something else. But he was one of the higher up in rank angels. He was kicked out of heaven because of his rebellion. The Bible says he took a third of the angelic host with him. That's quite a few. Satan and a number of his demons are still on the loose. They're going around this earth looking for whomever they may drink down. But some of the angels have already been condemned to the abyss. You may recall that when Jesus commanded some demons to leave a particular man, those demons begged him, oh, please send us into the pigs. Do not send us to the abyss. They were afraid of that. Peter mentions that right here. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into the abyss. It's the word Tartarus, actually. It's not the word hell. It's, it's the word abyss. And committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. I know that's an unfinished sentence, but just stop there. Notice how God will bring things to judgment 
And that includes the rebellious angels. He has put them into a kind of a prison because of a sin they committed in the past. And he decided that sin was so heinous, I'm going to lock you up right now. And you'll just stay in prison until judgment day. There are a lot of different views of this, but because of the sequence of events as Peter goes on to talk about it, it's like he's walking you through Genesis. And so the only sin that this really fits in chronological order is when it seems some of the angels came to earth and cohabited with women of the earth and that that bred the Nephilim. Again, others would disagree with that, but when you look at the way he outlines this going from one thing to the next, it's like he's walking you through certain sins in Genesis and this one is the first. So it's pretty early on. Whatever it was, it it certainly applies to only a select group of demons and not all of them because most of these demons are still running around. He put a few of them in the abyss and notice he's reserved them through all of these centuries for a time of judgment when the fallen angels will be judged in front of Jesus. If you turn a few pages to the book of Jude, verse 6. Now, if you have to ask which chapter... Uh, you've either got a faulty Bible or um, you're in the wrong place. Jude is so short it has no chapters, only verses. So verse 6 of Jude, he says a similar thing. The angels who did not keep their own position but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deepest darkness for the judgment of the great day. And that's all the Bible has to say about when the angels will be judged. Just those two references. And so because my mama didn't raise no stupid children, I'm not going to make any other statements about this. Other people can go where angels fear to tread if they want to, but really that's all we know. And we know that because all judgment has been given to Jesus, it must be Jesus himself who will preside over this. But other than that, that's what we know. So go to Revelation chapter 20 and we'll wrap it up here. This is the final judgment. The last judgment. Revelation chapter 20, and I'll just tell you, this is one of the saddest scenes in all of Scripture to me. Not because the present heavens and earth have been destroyed, not even because the new heavens and earth haven't been yet created. And you know, my mind's going a thousand different directions. No extra charge for this, but a thought just hit me. You know, None of us were sitting around watching God create heaven and earth, right? Nobody was there. We will all get to watch him create the new one. Have you ever thought about that? That just hit me. I mean, wow, I I can hardly wait. We got a front row seat to God speaking the new heavens and the new earth. I never thought of that before. Woo! Well, anyway, this is one of the saddest scenes in all the Bible to me. The present heavens and earth are gone. The new heavens and earth have yet to be created. And there's no place for anyone to stand. There's just this vast emptiness. And here's this great white throne. Again, obviously with the Lord Jesus sitting on it. Because we read in John, God the Father has given all judgments to God the Son. So this has to be the Son. Here's this enormous crowd of people in front of him. All of whom have rejected him as Messiah. In verse 11 of Revelation chapter 20. I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, books plural. And then another book was opened, the book of life. If I can interrupt you and ask a question, if these are all non-Christians, and they are, and if all opportunity to become a Christian has gone away, which it has, why open the book of life? The opportunity for salvation is over. No invitation for salvation is going to be given here. Nobody gets a chance to change their mind. Why even open the book of life? I believe there's two reasons, and it's just my opinion, okay? But here's what I believe. I believe, first of all, God opens the book. I think there's going to be blank pages in that book. Remember, Peter says it. God doesn't want anybody to perish, which means what? There's room for them to come. I wonder if God will show them blank page after blank page as if to say, your name could have gone right here. I didn't choose to condemn you. I had room for you. 
My desire was for you to come to me for salvation. My desire was for everybody to repent. I'm willing to save anybody who comes. I wonder, it's just an opinion, just a thought. I wonder if the book of life is open to show them that. And to help them see that the only reason their name is not included there is not because there wasn't room, but because they chose to reject God and his Messiah. But also, and I think that's indicated right here in Scripture, it's to show them that because their name isn't there, all they have is what they did. See the end of the verse? The dead were judged according to what? Their relationship to Jesus? No, they don't have one. According to their works as recorded in the books, plural, that we saw a moment ago. The sea also gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. All were judged according to what? To what they had done. To what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I know this is not popular in our day, this subject of this final judgment in the lake of fire. I know a lot of people, even in some churches, dismiss this whole idea, saying, oh, God is too loving to do such a thing. Others have tried to lighten it by suggesting that hell is only temporary, and at some point God will just obliterate the lake of fire, and so those who are there will just suffer a short period of time and it will be over. But folks, it's part of the word of God. Not only here, but elsewhere. In fact, did you know that Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven? Tends to make me think it's real. I am absolutely convinced that God has prepared a place of eternal punishment for those who choose to reject Jesus. I'm convinced it's eternal. It's a place of punishment. And it's where everybody will be sent who chooses to reject the Son of God. Since the unsaved here have rejected Christ's work of redemption, for them, the only thing upon which they can be judged is their own works. That's all they've got. Their works. Good, bad, whatever. And it will all be judged in comparison to God's holiness and God's righteousness. And they will see that even the best of the best of what they have done falls well short of God's glory. See, that's the difference. When you and I as Christians, when our works are judged at the judgment seat of Christ, here's some really exciting news. Our, we are covered in the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. So while the quality of our work is evaluated, no matter what remains and no matter what burns up, Paul says it, we are saved as though through fire. Why? Because we are covered in the righteousness that was given to us through grace because of our faith. That's what qualifies us to enter into the kingdom. It's his righteousness. But the unsaved, they don't have that. All they have are their works. And none of it measures up. That will be true in the case of every unsaved person, no matter how giving or how nice or how good they may seem. And the Lord will say to them, and, and it's, it's just sad, millions upon millions, he will say, go away from me into the lake of fire. Jesus says elsewhere it was prepared initially for Satan and his demons, but I've had to enlarge it to make room for you too. Because you rejected my offer of salvation. I died on the cross for you and you said no to that. And so now I have to say no to you. And you and your unrighteous condition, you cannot come into my holy presence. That's why I say it's the saddest moment in the Bible. And please, please, please do not for one moment think that God finds some kind of sadistic pleasure in doing this. I believe God's heart is broken over this. But because God is just in, in keeping with his justice, he has to do this. I cannot fully explain it. I don't know how it will be possible for a person to exist forever through all eternity future in a state of torment and anguish. I don't understand that. But I do understand this. No one has to endure that. God doesn't really send people to hell nearly as much as they choose to go there in their rejection of him. I've heard people say that. How could a loving God send people to hell? Listen, 
A loving God sent His Son to die for you so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. It's in rejecting that that you send yourself to hell. Jesus said, remember from the scripture reading, truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has everlasting life, spiritual life. He will never come into this judgment. Never. You will not face, you won't be there at the great white throne. You pass from spiritual death to spiritual death. Life, John 5, 24. The moment you believe through saving faith, at that moment, you get spiritual life. And you don't have to go here. Let's bow our heads. I'm guessing that the message of the gospel is really not new information to anybody listening to me right now whether you're in this room or you're listening online. And maybe you even spent a few years considering some of this stuff. I would, I would encourage you today to face the reality of it. If you've never come to Christ in faith, you are still spiritually dead and your sin nature is in control of you. And probably just the events of this past week are enough to prove that that's true. The very best you have to offer when measured against God himself is never good enough. Today, God has given you one more opportunity to turn to him. He created you. He loves you. He sent Christ to redeem you from sin. If you've never done it before, right now, in this moment, wherever you are, you can give your life to God in Christ. Tell him you love him. Tell him you want to have a restored relationship with him. Tell him that you know that the only way to do that is through the death of Jesus on the cross. Tell him you want Jesus to be your Savior who died for your sins, who rose victorious over sin and death from the grave. Tell him you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, controlling and directing your life. You can do that right now, wherever you are. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise in Jesus coming back. He is patient, not wanting you to perish. But he wants you to come to him in repentance for salvation. Today is another opportunity for you to do that. For you who've already done that and, and live for the Lord as a Christian, I just take you momentarily back to that need for constant, continued self evaluation. You are sustaining that discipline, aren't you? You're not making sin a sort of casual thing like our world does. Thinking, oh, that's not that important, really. Oh, that's just such a light thing. There are no light sins to God. There are none. As his children, he expects us to be holy. He says it. You be holy. You be different. You be distinct. You, rep you represent me. You're my child. And when things come into the life that are not supposed to be there, God says, I expect you to take care of that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. And he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whichever path you need to walk, whether coming to Christ for the first time or coming to Christ in the need for confession and repentance, I encourage you this morning, take care of that if there's a need to do so. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for the day you've given us. It's a serious and somber subject, these judgments, and yet for us as Christians, if we're keeping short accounts of sin, not so much. The serious and somber part is to think of those we know who've yet to come to you or who as Christians refuse to confess and repent and just go on in a sinful condition. We pray for either of those people. 
either those who need to come to you in the first place or those who need to come to you for cleansing and forgiveness. Lord, I pray for them. Help them to take you seriously. You don't grade on a curve. You grade according to one standard, and that is your own holiness. We need your righteousness wrapped around us or we have no hope. And we need your cleansing or we come before you dirty. So, Father, help us. Help us to come to you. Help us to stay close to you. Help us to take you seriously. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. times ahead for some people, but there's going to be some terrible times ahead for other people. But you offer us the good times ahead. And I just pray each and every one of us here will make that decision in the right way and decide to follow Jesus to the best of our ability and to the best of, of uh, letting Jesus work in our hearts. And we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>